Hospopreneurs. Hello and welcome to episode 12 of the Hospopreneurs podcast. On the show today, Dan Norris, international speaker and best-selling author, entrepreneur, marketer and owner of Black Hops Brewing, shares his wisdom and insights directly with you. This episode has an insane amount of value packed into it and it is a long one, but it's well worth it. So sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks for having me. Can I do Instagram Live while we're doing this Absolutely. Of course you can. <laughs> right. um, so Dan, uh, the first thing I like to do to start off the show is a crazy hospitality story. What's something funny, exciting or strange you know, you've seen working in the industry? Oh my God, what's the rating of this show? <laughs> uh, <laughs> It is explicit, so you, you can, you can uh, say whatever you'd like. I, I, I honestly, like, I've never worked in hospitality before this. So I always think mm. it's kind of weird. Like, I was working for 11 years. I was working in an office for five years, and then I worked in online business for, like, 11 years before this. So yeah. this is literally my first introduction to hospitality. I've never worked in bars right. or anything. So any crazy stories I have for you would be... Me as a customer, not as a business owner. <laughs> but yeah, no, I don't, I don't know. I don't think I have anything too crazy. Um, anything funny, exciting, interesting? Any uh, even in in the in the time you've been doing it, something something to share? Um, I don't think so. No? I don't think I have much. That's okay. Any, no a good answer for that one. No worries at all. Um, so Dan, you're referred to as a serial entrepreneur. Uh, what does that actually mean? And you know, how can how can someone become one? Uh, well, first of all, you probably shouldn't become one. <laughs> um, I'm going to drink this beer. Yeah, let's crack them. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, serial entrepreneur just basically means someone with ADD so bad that they can't pay attention to anything for more than five minutes and um, just works on way too many projects at once. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, hopefully one, one or two of them go well, but quite often they, they don't. <laughs> so yeah. that's probably what it is. But <laughs> I, I just like the, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, some people get into it this kind of thing because they love the product or because they love the lifestyle. I just love business. Mm. So it could be this, it could be online business. It really, it probably wouldn't matter so much to me what the business was. I just like the process of creating stuff, branding and storytelling and uh, just creating a business that didn't exist before and building up everything that's associated with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, if a, a serial entrepreneur probably just means someone who's dumb enough to keep doing it over and over <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. I like that you brought up storytelling there and we'll sort of touch on a little bit of that uh, later in the episode. Um, the, way, the way I think about uh, entrepreneurship is really just creating and extending value. And then uh, if you're a serial entrepreneur, just doing it over and over again. Yeah, um, well, I mean, probably I'd say 90% of the things I've created went out of business quicker than I created them. So I'd say there was like zero value. But um, it, 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 it depends. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, you kind of, I mean, yeah. I, I, I sort of t tend to stay away from those kind of g generic terms. Like we, in this business, for example, we're, we're just creating a product and we're trying to do it in a way that has a different spin on it. Like obviously you wouldn't come in to any industry and do exactly the same thing that everyone was doing. Mm. Otherwise you would just get no attention and it, would, it, it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. Um. So to me, it's not, it's not so much about value. Like it's, okay, well, beer is valuable. It's interesting. But really like what's, what's interesting about what we're doing compared to what Burley Brewing were doing before us or what Stone and Wood were doing, um, it's not so much that our beer is more valuable. I mean, product is very, very, very important. But it's really like it's really our story and the way we're presenting it, the mm -hmm. styles that we're doing, um, the, something that people can – kind of attach themselves to i guess a bit of like a the idea of like three blokes who just decided that they're going to brew a home brew and they're going to turn that into a business <laughs> um end up brewing a beer with call of duty and all this all this other crazy shit happens so just that kind of story and that idea is that's the stuff that excites me about business um but yeah i guess it's creating something valuable and hopefully hoping that someone buys it off you mm, <laughs> and mm. and not only some customers but also you know, investors or shareholders or, uh, you know, the media. You're constantly creating stuff that you need to sell to somebody. Mm. Um, so it is all about that unique story. Uh, and, and again, this storytelling has come up again. So I'd like to uh, definitely um, expand on that a little bit later on. Yeah. Um, but uh, what is it? Cause, and I'm also going to ask what it is that, that you guys um, are doing a little bit more. But can you please tell us a little bit more about where we are today? And thank you very much for having us here. Um, so we are at the Black Hops um, Brewery. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the brewery here? 
Yeah, well, so we've got a brewery downstairs. Um, we're, at the moment, we're sitting upstairs in my office, which we've used for doing our Black Ops podcasts. Mm-hmm. And I just work here because I, I worked in an office for so long, I can't work downstairs at the bar with all the noise. <laughs> um, but yeah, so downstairs, we've got the bar, we've got the brewery. Uh, upstairs, we've got offices. Across, across in that building there, it's basically exactly the mm-hmm. same building. We've taken over that as well and we're um, expanding with more tanks into there. Mm-hmm. So we've, we've been, we were contract brewing uh, before we opened here, which is basically going to another brewery and brewing our beer and selling it under our name um, for about a year or so before we opened. And then this brewery was opened in June last year. Mm-hmm. And since then, we've basically maxed out capacity and we're moving into the place next door because we need, need more tanks. Yeah. So that's that's cool. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been an interesting year. Yeah, but it's yeah it's it's been it's been good. I think it's, I think we for a while we we sort of had to work out what our like range of products were. Like we, we brewed probably forty or fifty beers in the last eighteen months. Mm. Um, but working is, out what it, people want is is different to what you want to make. So that's been a bit of a process. Is that a typical amount, forty to fifty beers in that time? Um, probably not. Mm-hmm. No, um, I think. So, so when we st- started, we did the eggnog stout, which is w- one you liked mm-hmm. um, in particular. So that was that was like kind of our our first idea, if you like, mm. for a beer. Um, but working out from there, like you know, what's what's an interesting spin on different styles, or do we just brew like a standard beer of the style? Um, you know, what do you call the beers? You know, what just everything, every every last detail about them, the colours, the ABV, all of that, like, was just a process that we've been going through, you know, for 18 months. It wasn't it wasn't like we decided what beer we we're going to make and then we launched, you know, with that beer. Mm-hmm. So, which probably would have been a better idea if mm-hmm. we, if we had have been that organized because that seems to be a more efficient way to do it. <laughs> but we we experimented a lot and the ones that kind of rose to the top are the ones that end up being part of our core range. So, that experimentation was a combination of like single keg brews through to um you know, like the first time we brewed the pale ale was a four thousand liter batch that went straight into cans. Mm. Um, and there's everything. Which in is between. a real gamble. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, Govs is you know, Govs is an amazing brewer, and um, he, he he's obviously brewed plenty of pale ales in his life. Yeah. But, but yeah, it was basically like us sitting around and saying, "This is what we want it to be like." Yeah. And please make it like that because it's going to be our most hyped beer. It's going to be the first beer into cans. It's going to be get all this attention. It's going to be our first beer into bottle shops. We're going to put a decent marketing push behind it, so it was all, it all had to come together at that, you know, that exact moment. So yeah, Gov's nailed it, which is good. Mm. So what's the what's the story behind Black Hops? Just to just to tell tell everyone about you yeah know, what it's all about. Yeah, well, um, so me and Eddie have been best mates for years. Gov's used to work um, at Burley Brewing, probably oh, this is quite a while ago now, maybe five or six years ago. Me and Eddie used to go there. Um, just to drink on Friday afternoons. They had like brewery bash every Friday. Um, and so we, we, we became mates through that. And eventually that, that was sort of my introduction into craft beer. Like before then I was sort of into, like if I bought beer, I'd buy like little creatures or something, but I wasn't like that really got me like deep into the craft beer and experiencing all the different beers available. So Eddie got like really deep into it. I kind of went along the journey with Eddie. Um, and one day we were sitting at Mount Tambourine and Govs was there and Eddie started talking about this beer he wanted to make. He actually had, had told another brewery about this beer, which is the eggnog, mm-hmm. as part of a competition and, and you got to choose like the beer that they made. And he's like, oh, you guys should make this. I've got this really good idea for a beer. Um, and he didn't win, so they didn't make it. And so he just kept telling people about this idea. I'm like, all right, that's cool, <laughs> w- whatever. Because like, I'm not big on like tell people about your ideas i'm just like well fucking make it if, yeah if yeah but you know me and eddie didn't know how to make beer so i kind of i kind of <laughs> thought it wouldn't go anywhere but we but at that particular time govs had it was just really really fortunate timing like we mm. just we just seen govs at the pub um he just bought a homebrew system and he's like oh yeah well I'll, i think we can make that and we're like, all right sweet we'll, we'll make it so a couple of weeks later went up to mount tambourine at his house where he lived and um, brewed this like single keg home brew basically of eggnog <laughs> stout, um, and then because I like business and marketing and all the rest of it, we, we just for the next couple of weeks we just brainstormed ideas and we you know I, I designed these labels for the bottles and well, I think we registered an Instagram account and registered a domain name and all of this just kind of just probably just taking the piss at the time like me and Eddie had always joked about being in business together mm. and made up like when when we worked for the government we 
used to sell people coffees mm-hmm. for a dollar, like our co-workers. <laughs> and we'd go around and like sample coffees from all the different coffee places and pretend like we had a little business. It was just, I think like 99% taking the piss, but 1% like I thought, like I actually do like business. So if yeah. it happened, I'm like, sweet, we can do it. What did you do with the government? Uh, I worked in basically managing like IT projects. Mm-hmm. I, I, I have a HR background. So I did HR at uni and then I did a year of HR proper HR for a consultancy and then I went into get government um, at the train company at Queensland Rail basically in a HR role but I didn't I just didn't like HR I just kind of angled my way into IT projects mm-hmm. and um, then I, d- I left I, I think I stayed there for four years I left Eddie stayed there for another 10 years mm-hmm. um, and then yeah after the after the home break nog stout things just kind of started happening and we you know it, it became at some point i don't know when it became obvious that it wasn't we weren't just taking the piss with this yeah, black we're not in kansas was, anymore yeah, yeah it was actually going to be a business so went from that to gypsy brewing um and then after that we kind of ran out of tank space for gypsy brewing but we also knew like this is coming to the gold coast and and i'm like well i'm a business guy like i may as well do it mm, <laughs> so cool. so yeah i mean govs knew the beer eddie was ready to leave his job um, and, you know, I, I, I like all the branding and the business side of things. So we got together and built a brewery. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that story. The uh, to, If we stick with the, the personal front there, mm-hmm. what are you creating right now? Well, um, the last week or two I've been focusing on raising money mm-hmm. because we – we basically, we've taken over next door. We've ordered the tanks, but we have no money to pay for them. Mm-hmm. So um, I've been doing that for the last week. I put together like an investment prospectus, sent it out. We got absolutely smashed. Mm-hmm. I think I had like 230 people requested and 20-something people offer us money to invest. Um, way more, four or five times as much money as we wanted to raise. So it was, yeah, That's that's been my last week or two. Mm-hmm. Um and then once that's that's I'm sort of wrapping all of that up now. Once that's wrapped up, um, I'm focusing on more like packaging, branding, and marketing stuff related to the cans. Mm-hmm. So we've only got we've really only got pale ale in cans in venues. Um, so if you go to a bottle shop that sells our beer, they're really only going to have pale ale. Okay. Um, once we get more tanks, we'll have more beers. Oh, I think it's a pretty sexy looking brand. Like yeah. Well, we just as in the AOBAs, we just won a gold medal for this can, which was really cool. So this is. Something yeah. that me and Matt, the designer, um, spent a lot of time on. Like, there's a lot of detail in this that, you know, we've spent a lot of time back and forth talking about the design yeah. of Black Ops. Oh, but I really like it. Yeah, this this bit here is so so the logo. That's all hand hand drawn. Like Matt, mm-hmm. it's not a font. Like he drew all that out and um, created the monogram. That's all custom. This is actually a, a custom font. The word brewery. Mm-hmm. The design of the can being like a generic can with a label on it. Yes. Yeah was you know partly necessity but also partly like just to give it that craft sort of feel to it i like it Um, it's sort of it just feels uh grassroot almost it's like yeah that's yeah yeah that's obviously what what it's for you said if it's crafty yeah partly that also just necessity because the um the cans you have to order minimum sixty thousand at a time and so if we order sixty thousand cans but we have six different beers it's only ten thousand you know, you only have to use 10,000 to use them up. Mm. But if we order, um, have 10 different beers and we need to order 60,000 of every single can, it's going to get out of hand. Mm. So that, yeah, partly necessity in the scale we're at, but also um, I really like it because it sort of looks like, if you see it in the fridge, it looks like a can. It doesn't look like a label. And that was the idea. Yeah. But when you pick it up, you can sort you can you can tell it's, you, know, you can tell it's not a mainstream mass produced product when you pick it up, which is, mm. I think, important if you're going to sell a craft beer. Awesome. So, because you're working on a lot of different things, you you do, you've got a heap of different projects from what not, not so online. much anymore. I did. No? I mean, I've I've had lots of stuff in the past. I've, at the moment, I'm basically only doing Black Ops. Mm-hmm. I've got I've got all the books and everything, but I don't really that doesn't really take up my time. I do a okay, little cool. bit of public speaking, but not not a huge amount. So it's basically only Black Ops. Right. Awesome. Yeah. So what are you what are you learning about or exploring right now, personally? Um. Oh, that's a good question. I think just like this whole industry is 100% new to me. So like all, all my background's always been in like online marketing. My last business was um, like a support, a WordPress support business. So we had, it was about the same size that Black Ops is now in terms of like revenue. Um, it was a very profitable business. I had zero funding for it. I had 30 or so contractors around the world, no office. 
Um, it ran 24-7. It was a very, very, very different business to this. Mm-hmm. So everything, everything at Black Ops is new to me from the, you know, the packaging, the, the idea of working on a physical product, the, the nuances of brewing beer and all of the complexities involved in that. You know, the, the idea of having a bar, like a decent amount of our revenue is just the bar downstairs. Mm-hmm. You know, even working a bar. I never worked a bar before. <laughs> so ev- just <laughs> everything is new. So mm-hmm. yeah, everything. I'm learning about everything at the moment. So... Other than other than uh, you know just a love of of beer, uh, what what attracted you to opening a brewery? Um, it probably just the business part of it, just because I like businesses. Mm. It was it was really good timing because my other business, I actually like the day Black Ops opened, I had our first meeting with GoDaddy in America to talk about selling my other business, and that process took about six months, and I, and I sold that at the end of last year which enabled me to focus 100% on this. So it was very lucky timing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I also I always sort of thought if I sold that business, I'd do something completely different. And I, di- I, li- I wanted to do something that was had a physical element to it because I hadn't done anything like that before. I was thinking, I was just thinking main, maybe I would do some kind of physical product but um, or, or software as well because that's something I've always wanted to do, mm-hmm. which I've never really... Like a lot of the ideas I've had that have failed have been software products. Um, I think you mentioned on your one that you you'd worked on yeah. a couple. Yeah, so Ambi. Yeah. yeah, that was my first one, and yeah. uh, we did all right, and then ended up failing. But, yeah, um, yeah, and that's that a really happens. common story, and it's it's like that that like as far as a business guy, like the idea of having like a software as a service company, that's like the ultimate business model. Yeah. And, I, and I've I've you know, in the books and everything, I've talked about all of that. But the thing is, it's always there's a, a compromise in absolutely everything, mm-hmm. and so that's an idea that had some interest to me but physical products was interesting to me as well and this was just this just happened organically Mm -hmm. and so it worked out well that we we happen to be producing something that you can pick up and people can actually enjoy and you know know like my other business no one knew anything about it like on the gold coast you know no one knew anything about it i didn't have any staff here it wasn't an australian company yeah um i was i was just working on some online thing yeah Um, but this is this is a totally different thing you know like you go into bars people know the beer they know you they come in here the same people come in. It's a it's a totally different thing. I also mm. got um, I think I got a little bit bored of working on online a hundred percent of the time as well. Mm-hmm. Like you get a bit lonely working at home and just working via your computer and not being around people a lot. So yeah. I kind of I, I was going to somehow go down that path anyway, like open an office or do something that was more working with people and not remote. Mm. Um, so yeah, it all just came together and and it was good. It was good timing. Mm. Yeah, and it met it met most of the kind of the the check boxes for my, the next thing I wanted to work on. Awesome. Mm. Um, Dan, you've got your books all over the place here. Yeah. What, what's what's sitting on your bedside table right now? What are you reading? I barely ever read any books. Yeah? Yeah. I'm a really bad uh, book reader <laughs> person, which I, I always thought was funny. Like I always thought like it'd be cool to write more books than I read, which is probably really, really bad advice. <laughs> Have but you? Have you? No, nah, I think I've probably read more than <laughs> I've read. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I just get really bored. I think I need, like if I'm going to, Reading, I, f- I struggle with because there's just not enough, not enough senses are entertained when you read. Like I can watch like a good like movie, mm-hmm. <laughs> but reading I really struggle with. So, well, back to the bar. That's something that really attracts me to hospitality. Is mm. that it's the only art form that involves all five senses. Right. So that's yeah. something that I love about it because no other art form requires all five senses. So uh, that's something I don't know. That's something I sit and think about, but uh, I'm, a bit yeah. weird. I'm a bit weird like that. Yeah, you know, that sounds like a problem. <laughs> you might want, to, you might want to talk to someone about that. <laughs> um, Dan, 10 years, uh, 10 years in business obviously would have had its, its share of trials and tribulations. We touched on a bit mm-hmm. of that before. What's been your biggest challenge on your journey? Uh, I don't know. It probably depends how you measure it. I mean, I, I spent probably eight of those 10 years just completely failing and not making much money and just smashing my head against the wall trying to figure it out and then i spent like the last two or three you know really hitting uh, not home runs but you know doing well in a, in a bunch of different things so for the first eight years it was just it was just it just wasn't working nothing i did worked mm. and so, so there's everything everything you can think of that happens when you fail you know i had that so you know just dealing with psychologically you know, thinking about who you are as a person, if you, this is what you're committed to, but you suck at it. Mm. So all of that, um, financial problems, um, just also just being around people, like the idea of, because I, I was never really like a, 
super like charismatic sort of like salesperson. Not, I'm not really like a people person. So like just battling with the idea of like, do I have to be that salesperson um, mm. or like that front man type person for a business? Um, which ended up kind of reversing itself because I ended up doing public speaking and, and writing books and all this yeah, shit. Yeah, it's so interesting because obviously content marketing and yeah. speaking and yeah. Yeah, but I kind of naturally gravitate to the thing that puts me behind my computer. So, that, so the challenge has always been like, you know, obviously I like doing that and I'm comfortable doing that, but um, getting out there more around people has always been challenging. And working for yourself, working from home for a long period of time, I think is probably not good for you. Mm-hmm. I kind of thought it was good. I kind of bought, bought into the idea that like, working from home and working for yourself was so much better than having a job. But in the end, after doing it for seven or eight years, I kind of came to the conclusion that it's not really like Mm. there's plenty of people who have good jobs who are quite happy. Mm -hmm. And um, being an entrepreneur is not the be all and end all answer, especially if your role as an entrepreneur means you're just sitting at home by yourself Mm. um, and you have no balance between work and home and all of that. So um, yeah, I dealt with all of that stuff. Um, that's really yeah. interesting that you say that as well um, because I think ultimately what a lot of entrepreneurs strive for is is freedom. Uh, I, I, that's what I strive for anyway as, as mm. if I was to call myself an entrepreneur. Um, but I think everyone's got their own motives for it as well. But ultimately, it's about... I, I really think people should strive for adding, again, back to adding value, extending value. Mm. Uh, and I know that's abstract. It sounds super abstract and it is but it's about extending that value to as many people as you possibly can. Mm. Um, and I don't know, I suppose if you're chained to a desk, no matter what industry or, or how you're doing that, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're employed, it doesn't really matter. But if you're chained to a desk, it's, it's antisocial and, yeah. and probably unhealthy, uh, definitely unhealthy. Yeah, do it too much. I, I think it's, um, I don't, I mean, the idea of freedom, it, freedom's very overrated. I, th- I think you give, I mean, sorry, when I say freedom, I'm not meaning like freedom as in like, free people versus not yeah, free people. Yeah. I just mean the idea of having unlimited time and resources is actually a really bad recipe for happiness. It's a, it's a recipe mm. for, a, for a disaster really because mm. you have too many options and you, you end up just overthinking everything. Um, and I've had freedom as a, you know, an entrepreneur from day one, but that, that was certainly not the answer. Mm-hmm. Um, I, think, like, I, th- I think it's probably somewhere in like, I like making stuff, so anything whether it's making stuff, you know, writing a book or writing a blog post or, you know, making a beer, whatever, working on cars or just a- anything like that's, that's kind of like an underlying driver, I think mm. for me and a lot of entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, you get, you get entrepreneurs who are, you know, they just want to make money and that's cool and they just want to hustle and make money and that's fine. But I was never really one of those. I was, I was kind of in it because... I got too bored working for someone else because I didn't get to make enough interesting shit. Mm-hmm. So I, I went to work for myself and then that meant you've got a lot of flexibility to make more interesting stuff. You know, if I, if I feel like flying somewhere and writing a book, I can do that. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that to me, that's, that's what freedom's about. It's about having yeah, a choice. I mean, that's, use, that's useful from that point of view, but it also has its downsides, mm. I think. Because it's not, it's not about happiness. It's, happiness is, a, is, is an internal game. Uh, mm. It's got nothing to do with any anything that we do. I think people like. I think that's a that's almost like a whole podcast episode, yeah, uh, or more, a whole series, a whole show on happiness. Really, it probably is one out there. Well, it's, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think there's more than one. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, we touched on there uh, your trials and tribulations. Did you have anyone to help you through those? Those not really. Challenges? I had a wife, but we got divorced. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so I don't mm. know. I don't. I've never really been like a. Uh, sort of someone to, you know, have a mentor. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have always been pretty active in like entrepreneurship circles. So I've been in lots of online communities. I've got my own online community. Um, I've been been sort of, I, I don't go to a lot of events, but I, I speak at events. So I get to talk to people. I, you know, I catch up with entrepreneurial friends, probably not as much as I like, but I do that a fair bit. And I'm pretty active online, social media and um I've had I've got friends who are, you know, in business struggling all the way through to friends who are, you know, 10, 20, 30 times more successful than me. And I've, you know, I've ca- called on them from time to time, but I've never really had uh, one person that I go to to kind of help me through shit. Mm. But I think that I think it's because, again, I just I kind of get bored pretty easily. Mm-hmm. And I think the idea of a mentor is really I think it just really limits you. And like you end up just in this like hero worshipping mindset where you've got this one person you think who has all the answers 
but I think you just outgrow mentors as quickly as you, as you can find them. So mm. um, I've always had a lot of people around, you know, entrepreneurs around me, which is useful. And I've also, um, my writing helps a lot with that because I've always written about this stuff mm -hmm. and written about, you know, struggling as an entrepreneur. And that brings people into your circle who are also going through the mm. same thing. So you end up, you know, you relate to them, they relate to you. And so that's how, that's kind of how I've dealt with it. But yeah, I think having someone or a group of people is useful. I've just never been the, the person to have kind of like one mentor. Mm. It, it's come up a few times on the show about mentors. I, I like to ask whether um, my guests have mentors themselves. Um, but the best way it was described to me was by someone at, a, at an entrepreneurial event. Uh, and he said to, to have, to find someone who does what you want to do really really well and then learn that thing from that person mm. find someone else who's doing something else you want to do really well and have that person for that thing yeah so to take these bits and pieces from all these people that we meet in the world and not not to have one so it's interesting that you say you also support that not having one mentor yeah it's probably an individual thing i think if, if you're talking about like learning skills then maybe that makes sense but i just i've always thought like as an entrepreneur you you're on your own like that's the whole point of being an entrepreneur you, you're you're being the person who will do whatever you need to do to make it happen when 99 mm. percent of the population won't do that they'll mm. think about it they'll talk about it they'll tell their friends about it but at the end of the day they're just going to go work for someone else because they're not going to take the risk that you have to take as an entrepreneur and they're not mm -hmm. going to do what needs to be done so i've always thought you're kind of on your own and um if someone you know if an expert tells me i'm wrong I'm pretty quick to not care too much about that or if, if they tell me I'm right, I'm pretty quick to not read too much into that either because um, I think it's just all about experimentation and I don't mind the idea that you're on your own as an entrepreneur. I think it's kind of the point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are, you, are you a bit of a mentor yourself now? or uh, Not really. I mean, I have a com community. Uh, so I've got a, like a paid community that I have a couple of hundred members in. I've got a Facebook group, Seven Day Startup Facebook group, which is a free group. And there's, there's, there's lots of people in that group. Um, and then my content, I've got an email list. So, I, I, you know, I'm active online with all the people that kind of read what I put out or follow my journey or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely don't do any like coaching or mentoring or one-on-one -on -one or anything like that. And, and only because I don't enjoy it. And A, I don't do anything I don't enjoy because it's just a recipe for failure. And B, I'm not very good at it. And I think... Um, I'll do stuff like speaking at events and I've, I've tried to get better at that. Like I've actually learnt how to do public speaking and that kind of thing. Um, but the, the coaching and mentoring thing is just such a mess. I just, it, it doesn't interest me at all. And I don't think it actually helps that many people. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you, if I, like I said before, you know, if you want to be an entrepreneur, fine, you can get advice from people. But I think people just end up just hero, hero worshipping people who were successful 20 years ago and you know, I, I've, I've seen so much bad advice given to entrepreneurs. I just, I don't want to be one of those people that tries to tell someone else what to do in their business when I know nothing about their business. Um, so yeah, I can pretty safely say I will never go into coaching or mentoring. Mm, mm. I think uh, I can see the way that uh, that you're describing it is uh, so obviously through a, uh, you've got a particular perspective on it. And I think I can see where that might be coming from as well. There are plenty of coaches out there who, who are pretty awful with what they do. How can someone learn from you, from your your uh, successes and your failures? Is it through reading your books? Yeah, if they want to. I mean, I've, I've, I put out so much content on the internet. It's it's um anything you need to know about me is online. So mm -hmm. it's not it's not difficult. I've written four books. I've had my own podcast where I did eighty plus episodes. I've been on probably hundreds, if not bloody thousands of podcasts. I've done so many podcasts. Mm -hmm. When I did when I started um. The year before WP Curve, so I had a web agency, and then I sold it, and I basically said to myself, I'm going to buy, I'm going to build this software product. That was before I started my last business, and that year, I just committed to doing content, bulk content. So I wrote hundreds of blog posts. I went on every podcast that someone asked me to go on. Um, you know, I put out heaps of videos. I've done interviews with twenty or thirty people on video. I've done like seven day startup challenges where we get like hundreds of people to start a business in seven days and I do all that online. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done any type of content you can imagine I've done it. So, and it's all, and anything I've done is free and available on the internet. So yeah, you could, you could buy the book if you want, but um, there's heaps of interviews and podcasts. And, and in, at the end of the day, most of the, most of the people like, 
I think when you when you want to learn something, that's one thing. But the vast majority of people who consume the stuff that I write, I think they're just looking to connect with something that they're not like they're not going to learn something specific. Maybe like one of my books, Content Machine, is about content marketing. So that's maybe like if you want to learn about content marketing, it makes sense to, to read that book. Mm. But for the most part, the stuff that really gets traction is just the stories of you know ups and downs of entrepreneurship. And a lot of the time people are reading that for either, you know, some sort of emotional connection or just like to feel like they're, they're understood, mm-hmm. you know, because I've been through a lot of the shit that they're going through now. Mm. Um, so you're not, you're not necessarily consuming a lot of content or entertainment. That's the other thing. I consume a lot of content just, just for entertainment. Mm-hmm. Like, like I mentioned with the book, like I can read a book if it's really interesting. Like I can read the Elon Musk biography because mm-hmm. it's an amazing story. Mm. But the average book I read, it's it's not interesting enough. Um, mm. So yeah, I think like the storytelling, getting people to pay attention and like feel part of something, like feel part of the story, I think is like a lot of my content is about that. And a lot mm-hmm. of the content I think people consume is about that. Even podcasts, like I listen to podcasts all the time and I very, very, very rarely listen to a podcast where I'm trying to acquire a skill. Mm-hmm. It's more just like interesting stories. And yeah, I very rarely listen to a podcast where at the end I'm like, oh, I'm going to go and implement this thing that i learned you know it's not it's just not really what it is it's like to to be connected to a community be a little bit entertained be interested in the story that's Mm. what i think people get out of most of the content awesome i really like that and and there are plenty of marketers like there are a few marketers that i follow who say very similar things so that's awesome to awesome to hear um (laughs) seth godin and and, um well gary v is a big one a lot of people follow um but yes guys like i mean guys like Gary Vee, that, that's why I think it's good to have like a full range of people I follow. And when, when I say don't have mentors, like I've been following guys like Gary Vee and Seth Godin for mm-hmm. years and years. I mean, I'm not friends with them, but I know their content, I know their message. And I think all of that's super useful. I think it's more just for motivation though. Mm. But that... I, I call them digital mentors. Right. That's yeah. what I call them. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's probably what I am then, a d- digital mentor, because I don't actually sit down and mentor people, but yeah. I put stuff out and people, some people read it and... Um, they don't know that they're mentoring me. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But, but it, that's what I mean with, with guys like Gary Vee. Like, he's like the ultimate like hustle sales kind of entrepreneur. Yeah. And that's what I was always um, I always worried about. Like, I know I'm not like that. So can I actually be an entrepreneur? Um, and it turns out I can. It just took mm. me a while to figure that out. And so a lot, of, a lot of my stuff as well connects with people who aren't necessarily like that Gary Vee style entrepreneur mm-hmm. um, who are just out there just slaying non-stop all day and you know just selling non-stop and like that that part of entrepreneurship for me was just so foreign it's it wasn't interesting yeah wasn't it was really hard for me to do um but this the the thing with entrepreneurship is there's a million ways to do it yeah and if you can find out your style yeah your style or or just something you like like with marketing i a lot of people ask me you know like for ideas on marketing and Mm. Normally what I'll say is I know zero about any type of marketing at all other than creating content. And that's all I've ever done. And, you know, I built a, a bunch of businesses um, and made you know, a reasonable amount of money doing it. But I don't know anything about any other type of marketing. So if you want to know about content and stories and branding, then cool. But marketing generally, like you could you could be just be like Gary V style. And I mean, Gary V is obviously awesome with content. He's the king of content. But if you're like a sales-driven entrepreneur who, who just wants to get out and, you know, do sales meetings, mm. then that's your marketing. I, I, I can't tell anyone about that because mm. I don't know anything about it. But um, the, the good thing about entrepreneurship is if you can figure it out, then you can you can have your own style and, and do what works for you and turn that into something. And that's, I guess, the unlimited possibilities when you're working for yourself. Mm. We we opened up that on Gary V there. There's there's something so Gary V is obviously very much hustle and grind, you know, get that shit done, right? Mm. There like my mat there. Yes. Get shit done. <laughs> Love it. Um I'm sitting on a mat that says get shit done. Um <laughs> So I want to open that up a little bit more um, because there are all kinds of inconsistencies and, and paradoxes mm-hmm. in, in life. Um, like on one hand, um, uh, a well-known uh, saying among authors is you can't edit a blank page, right? right? But then on the other hand, you've got Lincoln saying, uh, what's the quote is, if you give me six hours to cut down a tree, I'll spend the first four sharpening, sharpening the axe. The axe. Yeah. So which should we listen to you know well we this sh- actually i actually put something on instagram about this the other day um 
I think I think the problem is that there's here we go. This is what I put on Instagram. Love it when people pull me up on my contradictions. They don't understand there is no secret. Because um, I think what people are looking for is a consistent message, a secret that other people don't know <laughs> that they can implement and then go from unsuccessful to successful. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is that in, in every, like all the people I've chosen to kind of follow throughout my life always end up being these characters like Tupac or Conor McGregor or just these, or Kanye or business guys like Gary V. I mean, just, just anyone who's interesting to me mm. ends up being someone who is full of contradictions. And <laughs> I think that's, I think that's the case with business generally. It's they're, they're just, there is no answer. Mm. And I think if you can get your head around the idea that there's, that you don't have to search for something that's going to give you a black and white answer, mm -hmm. then um, I think that can be really useful because a lot of people are just spending way too much time looking for that answer that doesn't exist. And they're looking for like a really simple formula for achieving success in business that just doesn't exist. I mean, a a any single formula you can give me about success in business, there's someone who's done the opposite of that and done very well. It's just, mm. it's just the way it is. It's, there's a lot of chance to it. There's a lot, a lot of timing, um, a, lot of, a lot of execution that people just overlook because they're looking for some kind of secret. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as soon as you can stop worrying about contradictions and stop looking for some kind of secret, you can focus on just the fact that if you make a lot of good stuff and your timing is really good and you take some risks and you have some luck um, and you get really good at what you do, mm. then there's some chance you're going to be successful. And that mm. means that there's some chance that you're going to be very, very, very good at all of those things and you're going to be unsuccessful. And yeah. you have to accept that because that's what being an entrepreneur is. I think uh, at 100%, 100%. I think that it's a lot about balance. Life is a lot about balance and circumstance and, and it's about applying which, which is the best in that scenario. Mm. And it's, I think to, it's finding out the the... The gold is in finding out what to do in what scenario. Mm. I think that's what it is because, as you said, people apply the totally opposite thing and it works. Yeah, um, that's right. And because because quite often the opposite thing is interesting to people because if you're going to do any type of marketing, whether it's content or anything anything else, the whole idea of it is that it's got to be interesting. If, if you're doing any kind of marketing that's not interesting, then it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So by definition doing the opposite of what everyone else does is interesting so just on that basis alone you know going against convention can be a really useful marketing strategy and that's something i've done quite a bit with um mm. with you know books like the seven day startup and uh generally just you know a lot of the content i write will be opposing ideas from other people who've you know tried to develop like a cliche that's got to be right all the time but mm -hmm. i know it's not um, and that, that will get you enough attention to get in the door because it'll be something that someone hasn't heard before and that's, that's what marketing is. Mm, that's interesting as well. Where did you learn that sort of that process or, or your marketing knowledge? I'm going to open up a marketing sort of a thread a little bit later on, but mm. can you tell us a bit more about that now? Probably just trial and error, I think. I think I'd, I'd tried every, like for my agency, I'd tried every sort of marketing you could imagine. I'd tried yellow pages, um, you know, paid ads, speaking at events networking events um online advertising more more recently you know i've experimented with facebook ads i've done blog posts podcasts everything mm. uh you know in person like webinars i mean i've just i've tried everything and i've just and I, when it comes to content I, i've written probably 500 plus blog posts and four books mm. and you just you do something enough and you start to get the hang of what works and i, I just noticed the only two things that really ever worked for me with my content, you know, I, I wrote probably 300 blog posts before I had one that had more than 10 tweets. Mm. So I, I wrote so much content that no one ever saw or ever cared about. And the two things I realized when I did that content was when I wrote something that was super useful, super practical, um, you know, really in-depth, like really well-executed piece of content. Like back then it was about... Uh, you know, building websites for business. So I'd write big, long website reviews or or, or whatever the case, you know, practical stuff like online marketing mm. guides or landing page guides, that kind of stuff. Um, when I did the super practical, actionable stuff, and same with the brewery, the content we do for that, that always goes really well. Um, 
transparency was another one if, if i could do content that was really transparent and raw that went really well for me the and so i started doing income reports in my last business mm -hmm. and with black ops we've done the same thing with the transparency like giving people an insight into the costs of running a brewery the materials you know how we go about the branding how we raise money for finance all of that giving them behind the scenes with the podcast and the other one was just contrarian it was mm. just putting out ideas that were different to what other people thought and those three things were really if i if i could pick up and well, i probably add to it now just with stories but at the time those were the three things where out of the three or four hundred blog posts i did all of them failed except for anything that was super practical um super transparent or contrarian and those were the ones that got attention so i just i paid attention to that and um I, yeah, I kind of just decided that that's the that's the marketing I would do. Awesome. So that's the obviously uh, we're talking a bit about marketing now. I'm gonna, as I've mentioned, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. But your books span a range of disciplines. Uh, you've obviously got a wealth of knowledge in it in a heap of different areas. Uh, I know you're very humble about that. <laughs> um, you've come across as very humble about that. Well, the thing is, it's not <laughs> actually that hard to write a book. Like I like my business partner said you should write a book, we'll do it together. And I'm like, oh, all right, well, I haven't, I hadn't thought about writing a book, but I'd written 300 mm. blog posts, which is way more than a book. Like it's as much as War and Peace. So I'm like, well, of course I could write a book. <laughs> yeah. And I wrote it in a week. And I've written like the other, that crowd hate the little one I wrote in two days. <laughs> nice. um, and the process of actually putting, self-publishing a book on Amazon and actually having a physical book like the books I have here is way easier than you would think. And it costs almost zero. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, it's, some of them have sold quite well. So it's not just creating shit products for the sake of it, but it's much easier to create a book once you know you can do it. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's it's a lot of people probably just don't even think they probably think like authors write books, and I'm not an author, but it, it's really not that hard to write a book. You know, if you can write thirty thousand words or forty thousand words on a topic, which is you know twenty blog posts, mm -hmm. then you can write a book. And the process of doing it is it's a pretty simple, it's a reasonably painful process, but it's a pretty simple. And reasonably cheap process so yeah well, once i realized i could write books i thought well i might as well write a book about building a brewery I, I, I wanted to write a book on creativity book on content marketing and i've written the one on startup so that was four mm. but yeah are you writing another book no i, I i'm kind of over it i i I've, I've thought about it. i've got ideas for books but i mean i i'm not really i'm not really a write, an author mm. i'm just you know i had these specific ideas like with seven day startup was a bit of a unique idea because i had a unique story around my business mm. and it was all about like you know every everyone's talking about validating businesses and i'd tried everything to validate this business and in the end i'd just given up and i'd launched this other thing in seven days and that ended up becoming a, a million dollar company in a couple of years and nothing i'd ever done had worked so it was an interesting story an interesting spin on the old idea of validation the mm. seven day startup um content machine was basically the guy in the office next to me said you should write a book about content marketing because that's how you build the business so <laughs> i wrote that um operation brewery made sense because we're building a brewery and we had all this content i'm like all right we'll write a book about that nice as a point of difference <laughs> and creator hate was like it was more like an ins inspired thing because it was like I, I had all these opinions about creativity and I, w I just wanted to write a book that sort of summed up what i'd learned about creativity so and that just came to me you know i was just on a plane and it just came to me but nothing's come to me since so i, I don't feel the need to write anything else well um, <laughs> I, I i haven't told you this but my first uh contact with you online was with create or hate all oh, right okay yeah and uh, i actually wrote it down it's been on my on my book list to, in my next big book buy oh, well, uh, it's actually one of, oh thank you there i you haven't go. read it yet thank you very much <laughs> thank you yours. very much i'm going to take that home thank no you worries. very much well, it's, a, it's a short book so it shouldn't take you too long to read it that's awesome thanks for that dan um I'm chuffed now. Um, so how does someone, I've, I mentioned your books there, how does someone acquire the level of knowledge that you have in such a broad range of areas? Is it, it, from, from what I'm hearing, it's, it's, it's about getting in and doing it. It's about getting your hands dirty. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've been in it for a while too. Like I've been in business for 11 years. Um, I've, I didn't read a lot of books, but I've listened to lots and lots of podcasts. Yep. So that probably helps. I've been really active in online forums. I think these days Facebook groups are really good for that. That's probably where I'm more active in. Mm -hmm. um, but forums are good. I, 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 I stayed away from local, which is kind of funny because what we're doing now is like so local. Mm -hmm. Up until a year ago, I pretty much ignored anything local and I really got inspired by what was happening overseas. And I, and I listened to shows like This Week in Startups and I really followed a lot of 
what Jason Calacanis did and what the big startups were doing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like like when Uber came out, you know, it was on that show they were talking about it when it was a couple of weeks old. Mm. And, you know, five years on, it's this gigantic multi-billion dollar company. Um, and I took a lot out of that stuff. So I listened to lots of podcasts, took a lot of inspiration from from uh, the, the, the local, local business here is interesting. It's like for hospitality and stuff, it's good. But for like tech startups and general like startups like marketplaces or software companies or even physical products it's just this is just not where you want to like this this, california is is where it all happens well not where it all happens there's interesting Mm. stuff happening all over but like this silicon valley startup thing is that's what i wanted to pay attention to because that's where all the crazy interesting stuff is happening and it kind of sucks a bit because like a lot of the innovative companies that probably could have been invented in australia are just coming over here now um, mm-hmm. And they were invented in the US years ago. And that to Australians, they're new, you know, like the Airbnbs and Ubers and mm. everything else. And Amazon's Tesla, about to come over. Amazon, all of that. It's just been around for years in America. Mm-hmm. And we, we probably could have thought of some of that stuff ourselves. Mm. But the reality is that's where the innovation was happening. So that's where I was paying attention to. All the content I was consuming was all the stuff from overseas. When I went to events, even speaking at events, I rarely, rarely speak at events on the Gold Coast even go to events on the Gold Coast. I was just doing it all overseas. Um, and yeah, different now because our business is very, very different to what it was back then. But I think getting that full range and not just having, like back back to the mentor thing, not just having one person who is apparently the guru, mm-hmm. just having a full range of worldwide experience really helped me a lot, I think. Mm. So it's what's your, what's your learning process then? You've talked a little bit about the sorts of resources there. What's your process of actually... Um, absorbing that information I, I think it, well i don't know i mean i think with i think the trap a lot of people fall into with learning stuff is they'll they'll pay attention to what who's making the most amount of noise and what people say to do which is not something i've ever done i've, I've never really bought you know internet marketers info products and followed like the big sort of online gurus i've always kind of just seen through it and i've more i've been more interested in looking at the companies I want to emulate rather than buying an info product from a marketer that tells me, you know, how to do something. Mm. So like for, you know, it really depends on what the skill is, but for stuff like design and branding, I've always just looked at how startups, like how the startups in Silicon Valley and other startup regions, how much they value branding and product and execution, even just every, even just buying physical products like that. Like I've got a few physical products in this room that I bought um that like that mevo live stream camera um or the iphone or like any of the the physical products that are being introduced now through that ecosystem they're so polished every aspect of what they do is so polished and thought out just the process of uh, unboxing something like all of that is so highly valued in that in that community of Mm. people so inspiration for design and branding and packaging and stuff comes from that not you know not from it's not just building a product and sending it to someone in an envelope you know what i mean like like this sort of stuff matters and the most valuable companies in the world value execution and branding so much mm. that they will you know they'll hire designers and give them equity um they'll you know they'll be they'll be paying designers an absolute fortune that there'll be designers on the co-founding team for businesses but you you, you look at other businesses locally and you think with the exception of hospitality business because that they're they're a um a group that does this really well but most for the most part local businesses don't treat branding seriously at all like people Mm. will be like oh guys um i've got three logo designs please tell me which one is the best one and i'm thinking like what what company that takes themselves seriously ever does that Mm. it's just an awful idea and it just shows that you just have no care for branding at all so so there's no design i've ever done or worked with someone on where I've, i've put it out there and said which one do you like like that's that's not that's not how design works um hmm. so yeah but i will say the exception of hospitality on the gold coast and in, in in brizzy as well that's something we do really well and and things like the execution on venues and like the fit outs and the design of venues all of that stuff is really good locally hmm. um and there's a lot a lot of really good local entrepreneurs who are working on you know restaurants and bars mm-hmm. and and doing different concepts in different places and that they're, they're, they're getting executed as well as anything I've seen around the world. 
Um, but I think that's a bit of an exception. The Gold Coast is good at that, but I don't think we're that much good at the other stuff. Okay, that's really interesting. There's a lot of lot of value in that. I'm, I'll definitely be listening back to that on my own show. <laughs> um, I I want to ask you, what's your process of? So we've asked about your process of learning. What's your process of? Uh, your your creative process. So, what's your creative process? How well, you you'll find out once you read that book. <laughs> I, <laughs> thank you. I won't. I won't make you repeat yourself. No, then. no, no. Um, creative process. Yeah, it, it it really depends on what it is. I think um, creativity is a lot about. It's a lot about productivity, and it's and it's a lot and and that's a lot of the point of that book is it, it's uh, creativity is a lot to do with just your overall mindset. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think the like, and the idea of this book is create or hate. Is, is the idea that you can, you can either the idea came from a Ricky Gervais quote, which was, um, um, I'd rather create something that others criticize than create nothing and criticize others. Mm-hmm. And it was that idea that you can choose to hate on something, or you can just choose to make stuff. And if you choose to make stuff, you're going to get a lot of people who are on the other side who are just going to hate the stuff you made. Um, so, so to work on the skill of making sure you have enough empathy and gratitude and, um, like those kind of things, like those mental skills are necessary for creativity because as a, as a person who creates a lot of stuff, you're just going to put it out into a world where half of the people are going to hate it. So, um, that, that psychological aspect to it, you know, working on empathy, really understanding people, being grateful, just just killing negativity at any moment. I'm super super sensitive to negativity. Like, I, like even w- even when I go out to dinner with a group of people, as soon as someone says anything negative about the restaurant or about the food or about how comfy the chairs are or anything, I'll just like fuck you, fucking ungrateful person. Like mm. the amount of thought that's gone into this. We're all mm. here. We see each other once a year. We've got this amazing food. Yeah. And you're complaining about the chair. Yeah. Like, like they're the kind of people who never create anything mm. because the, because hate has taken over. So I think creativity to me is not a process. It's more like it's a mindset, um, but it's also it's got a lot to do with productivity. If you, if you create a lot of stuff, then by definition, you're creative. Yeah. So I, I've always focused on you know, the idea of, consume, of, of creating more than you consume. So yes, I listen to a lot of podcasts, but I've written a shitload of books and created a lot of podcasts mm. as well. And if you try to make more stuff, then by definition, you're going to be more creative. Mm, I really like that. I've got a friend who also says uh, to be a net creator. Right. Uh, I love yeah. that. I really like that. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I, I either stole it from them or they stole it from me. <laughs> oh, I don't know no. which it is. <laughs> uh, um, I, 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 he's probably heard your stuff. Oh, right. uh, that's <laughs> more far more likely. Um, we brought up, so that sort of touches a little bit on marketing there. And I said I was first exposed to you via your books. Um, but I was actually first exposed to Black Ops. I didn't, uh, separately, I didn't know oh, okay. that you were involved with Black Ops originally. Yeah. So I first saw Black Ops on Instagram and absolutely loved uh, how you guys ran the account. So, oh, yeah, that's right. I heard that on your podcast with Matt. That's cool. Nice. Yes, Eddie does that. I told him that because, you know, it's good to give people I'll, compliments. I'll have, to, <laughs> I'll have to compliment him myself. Right. I, I uh, just met him for the, for the first time yeah. a little bit earlier. Um, just It was just, yeah, it's just quality, consistent content, uh, a lot of stories, and obviously, that's a background of, of yours and, you, and you've got a book on it. So what content platforms and, and traction channels have you found the most effective for hospitality? Yeah, well, Instagram for sure. Um, I think when... So my, my background with the online stuff was all about mainly written content, the content I was doing. So I was doing blog posts, which were really good for Google. I was doing a lot of podcasts, which are good for brand and getting the word out there, but but very hard to measure in terms of whether it's a useful thing to do. Mm. Um, I've, I've really only done ever done two podcasts where I've got immediate business as a result of them, mm. and I've done hundreds. Um, but with Black Ops, we noticed immediately Instagram was really big. Um, I was getting into Snapchat when, around about when we started as well, and I kind of saw the stories on Snapchat were getting a lot of traction on my personal one. I st- mm-hmm. end up stopped using it when Instagram started doing it because mm-hmm. they virtually just ripped them off. I think a lot pixel. of people have. Yeah. Black Ops never really got into Snapchat, but the idea of doing those stories, we kind of developed a skill or, or like the, the knowledge that that was going to be a big thing. So once they have it on Instagram, you know, we're trying to do that as much as we can. Mm. Um, but at the moment it's Instagram. I think in terms of platforms, Instagram Facebook, Instagram stories are really big. Um, we also have an email newsletter. We've got a podcast. We've got the book. We've got written content as well, which we do every week. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we also do a lot of, like I do other podcasts and we do events and stuff as well. Mm-hmm. Like Govs will do uh, speaking at events, which, which, is, which is all content. Um, and do you do tap takeovers and things? Yeah, we do. We do. Yeah, all, all sorts of stuff. So yeah. any, any sort of education around beer, um, I, I kind of wrap up into content. And, we, and, and we'll do a lot more once we get our little pilot system and do mm-hmm. more events here. But yeah, as far as platforms go, Instagram seemed to be the one. I think there was like for there was sort of Facebook, which was more personal, and then there was Twitter, which was more, you know, influencer. Yeah. And then Instagram just sort of filled the gap in between. Which I assume is why Facebook bought, bought them because Facebook just didn't seem to do the influencer thing very well. Yeah. Um, and Twitter was a bit too clinical for an industry like this. It like some industries are really big on Twitter. Yeah. And my last company, um, or like the years leading up to that, I was pretty active on Twitter with the content. And but with hospitality, it seems to be Instagram just just found that perfect slot in the middle where you could. You could do the really high quality stuff, but once they in- introduce the stories, you could also do the the storytelling and the rapid fire content mm. that you have on Twitter. Yeah, and um, so people who are natural storytellers or, or less natural oversharers uh, get get the benefit from the stories as well. So it's just Instagram just seemed to take over. So our Instagram's been growing pretty well, and and not not just the numbers, like the traction and the engagement we get on there is really good. Facebook is, is really good for us too. We've got a Facebook group mm-hmm. called Black Ops Ambassadors. So if anyone's into beer or hospitality, you can join that or business. Like we've got all sorts of conversations happening in there. The mm-hmm. groups on Facebook for me personally have been quite big for the last couple of years. Yep. Really big for my books and launching stuff. Yep. Um, is pages not so much, but the groups have been really big. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask if uh, the same traction channels were useful for your personal brand. No, not really. Like I... WP Curve didn't have an Instagram account, um, didn't ha- didn't have a Facebook page. My personal brand, I've got a personal Instagram account, but for a long time it was just like photos of beer. Um, it wasn't it wasn't really serious personal content. My personal Facebook account gets a lot of traction, but I've never got traction with my pages. I've ha- I've got a page, I've never got traction with it. Um, it just hasn't worked. But Black Ops Facebook page goes really well. The Facebook group goes really well. Um, Instagram goes really well. I mean, my personal Instagram is pretty good as well, but Black Ops, it's just more, you can tell with content, one of the big things in my book was like, just don't pay attention to all the vanity metrics because it's not it's not like the amount of hits or the amount of follows you have that really tells the story. Like what tells the story is like how many real people are actually mm. engaging with you. So I can tell, I, I know that with Instagram and really any platform that's ever got traction for me, I've known it because real people have have interacted with me on it or yeah. they've told me. So podcast is a good example. You don't get any interaction with the content, but you go out to an event and people tell you they listen to it. Yep. So you know it's actually connecting with real people. Mm. Um, Instagram stories, I, as soon as I started doing them on my personal one, I started getting all these replies back from people. So I'm like, okay, well, maybe people actually do follow my Instagram and like yeah. they actually like seeing this stuff. Um, so and Same with Black Ops, the content we put on Black Ops Instagram goes really well and we have real people that do it, that read it and consume it and reply to us. Um, same as the content on the blog. So that's when you know it Like it is actually working. Mm. Well, you mentioned there, uh, uh, well, actually about, there was a point there that you made that I read in Crush It by Gary Vee, which is yeah. that the, it's not about the figures. It's about, you know, it's about who those figures are. You know, they could yeah. be really important people listening to whatever it is that you're you're spruiking and it's going to be far more important than thousands and thousands of people who aren't going to do anything. Yeah. yeah. I think people need to be really careful with, with like follower numbers and stuff. I mean, I, there's so many people who have big Instagram accounts that are trying to make money by selling posts for $50 and they've, they've just got no business and not making any money at all. Yeah. But you look at their account and people just assume they're like a major boss. Yeah. But it's just not how it works. I mean, there, there are... There are people who do have a lot of followers who also do have a good business. Like my mate Nathan with Founder Magazine has got a million followers. Um, but he's also got a really good business and a really, really good brand. He's, he's another guy who's just really, really big on branding. Mm. Um, so th- it, it does exist. You do have a lot of uh, people who've got a big following and have got a good business behind it. Mm-hmm. You see it a lot also with like the fashion. Yeah. A lot of really, really big fashion Instagram accounts do have actual legit businesses behind them and, and are like some really good success stories. Um, they're obviously also great Instagram. Yeah. Uh, like Instagram's a great channel for those guys. Obviously, Perfect. It's very yeah. visual. Yeah. Very, like, bam, that's why food's great. Yeah. Hospitality's great. Yeah. 
yeah. yeah. And and but but then there's so many accounts that have just got you know celebrity pictures with quotes and stuff on mm. them, and and they're just they got a lot of followers, but they they just got no real business and they're not making any money at all. So yeah. if, you, if you chase chase that like number of followers, which which is always a you know it's it's appealing to your ego, which is a, a really core part of your being to want to have more people following you. So it's a, it's something you battle all the time. Mm. But in the end, it's it's really not about that. It's not it's not about it never is about the number of hits or the number of followers. Yeah. So who do you believe is a real authority when it comes to marketing? Who do you uh, follow or look up to or who do you believe people should? Well, I mean, like I said before, it's marketing is way too broader of a term. It's it's um Okay, yeah. I, I think like the, to me the stuff that I'm, you know, into and passionate about is branding, um, content social media but to me social media really is more it's really just content um and the platforms change but it's it's kind of the same thing um and yeah who are the who are the influences around those sort of things i mean content someone like gary v is just killing it with all the content he's doing um branding i don't really follow individuals with branding as such i mean i follow designers like matt Matt Vigotis, who who did these cans, is a good good mate of mine. Mm-hmm. I'll I follow designers like that stuff as well. Yeah, and there's a, there's a bunch of guys who do like lettering and like wall art and stuff, which I'll follow. But but to be honest, with with design, I've always thought it's if you leave the design in the hands of the designer, you're not going to get a good result either. Like a, a lot of ninety nine percent of the design is all comes down to the entrepreneur actually understanding it and having a vision for it because it's. If, if you don't really care about design, it doesn't matter who you're going to get to do it for you. They're just going to do their own thing. Mm. And it's, it's you know, I guess I guess you, you'll get a better result if you pay someone who knows what they're doing. But it, in the end, it's on you. So I think I think I, I more follow entrepreneurs. And like Nathan, I mentioned as, as an Aussie example, is a guy who takes design. Actually, I've got his book right here. Mm. Sorry, this is not very good audio reading, but that's <laughs> Nathan. Like, have a look at this book. This is the book that he did for Founder Magazine. Mm. It's it's a beautiful, phenomenal book. This is a great looking book. Yeah. And yeah. this is the sort of thing he's like, well, if I'm going to make a book, I'm going to make something that is like truly world class. Yeah. And that's a guy who takes branding seriously. Um, and, and other entrepreneurs are the same. You know, like if you look at Tesla, like look at all their branding, look at the way the car looks, look at every single detail. Actually, the, the one entrepreneur I got inspired by the most from design was Steve Jobs and reading reading his book. I also love that he's got uh, Gary V and Seth Gary Gary on there. On Both the of those two guys that I just mentioned. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> he put me in there as well, but my photo's not in there. But my name's in there and there's a, there's a page on there about Seven Day Startup, which is cool. But yeah, uh, the Steve Jobs biography was the big turning point for me when I read that book. Mm, mm. It was just this idea of just ruthlessly, you know, he he he's not personally a designer. Like he had, he had Johnny Ive that he was working with on design, but he'd taken the time to do lettering classes and just be ruthless around product design. Yeah. That in the end, um, you know, Apple, Apple would not have beautiful products if the boss of Apple did not give a shit about design mm. and was not just ruthless about amazing execution of yeah. design. So totally. to me, it's all, it, it's all down to the entrepreneur. And if, if you're, you're the entrepreneur, that is putting the three logos on Facebook and asking a bunch of people who know nothing about design to lead your design process, then then you're failing from the beginning. Yeah. But yeah, entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs, Elon, all the all entrepreneurs that are working on startups, you know, that sort of come out of that Y Combinator, like Silicon Valley ecosystem, like th- those kind of startups, like the big, like high growth, high funded startups, they're all the people I follow and I look at the way they do their branding. Not so much following a designer and you know learning like reading a book about design it's more yeah. um more following that and also looking at other parts of the world you know looking at architecture and nature and stuff like that is really like like a lot of these designers will be really deep into that and that's why i think as an entrepreneur you really have a strong role in design too is because designers will just get carried away mm. and and they'll just get so deep in the subliminal messages of the design that most people like maybe only subtly pick up on and so mm. as an entrepreneur you got to reel that in as well so it's 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 a process i think with with something like apple you wouldn't have amazing products if you didn't have the entrepreneur and you wouldn't have amazing products if you didn't have the the world's best designer mm. um mm. but yeah that's that's how i go about it as opposed to kind of like following too many designers and following like how they execute cool if we um if we move more into the hospitality 
realm. Mm-hmm. Um, how how uh, is innovation being applied in hospitality, and what what innovation have you seen in the industry that's taking place? Not a whole lot. I think the in- innovation to me is not. It's very rarely the most important thing. I mean, it's, I think it's it's <laughs> like, okay, like if you, if you look at a restaurant, it, it has to be different. Mm. Whether whether like you know executing a fit out of a restaurant or a meal, or designing a meal or designing drinks differently to someone else's innovation, I don't really think of that as innovation. I think of it as differentiation. Mm. Like it's okay. like you're not inventing. Uh, a new, you know, you're not you're not building a Tesla that, that runs without fuel, you know, that's going to comp- drive faster than mm. a bloody Ferrari. Like that's that's innovation. Because um, I would call that invention almost. It's almost, like- yeah, almost. Although if you look at a lot of what Elon has done, um, a lot of it is not invention. A lot of it's reinvention and innovation. Mm. Um, you know, like the Hyperloop idea was not. He wasn't the first person to think of that idea. Um, Electric cars, he was definitely not the first person to do electric cars. There was electric cars for years and years and years before he started playing around with electric cars. Um, the, the, I, guess, I guess the rockets, um, he's pioneering the idea of reusable rockets, but there's a lot of other people working on that as well. Um, he, and so He might be the first to take us to Mars. He might be, yeah. Yeah. Maybe. That's, but, but again, it's, it, it won't be because of an invention. It'll, it'll be because of a... Uh, working out a better way to do something, mm. which to me, like an invention is very, very rarely does does a, a, an inventor become a successful entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. It's That's kind of like the, you know, you think about like the real sales focused entrepreneur or you'll think about like the inventor. Mm-hmm. Um, but hardly any entrepreneurs I know are inventors. It's, it's just not really what works. Mm. Um, but yeah, innovation is a bit of a weird word because like just doing something slightly different like you know, like when restaurants open up that are, that are slightly different, I think is awesome. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that innovation. I just think, again, like we talked about before, just doing the same as what everyone else is doing is not working. Um, and if you can do something a little bit different, either in your marketing, like these boys next door, at Pickle, um, have a bunch of burger joints, and mm-hmm. they have they they do like those crazy burgers with like twenty patties, yeah. and their Instagram's wild. Their stories are really they're just really just naturally. I don't know if they've got like marketing backgrounds, mm. but they're just naturally really good at that style of marketing That's that they right. do. They get a lot yeah. of attention for it. They execute their restaurants really well. Um, their foods really, they, they, they're just, they're, they're kind of doing, there's a bunch of people like that that are just doing everything a little bit differently and doing everything really well. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't necessarily use the word innovation for that, but that's that's happening a lot. So that's an example. There's heaps of other restaurants opening up um, and there's other breweries as well that just coming in into it with their own sort of unique spin mm-hmm. that are getting a lot more attention because they're, they're bringing something to it that's a little bit different. So if, uh, if we stay away from the word innovation, I like to, to use the word innovation, um, but if we stay away from that word and we say using a unique spin or creative mm-hmm. uh, spin on things, uh, do you think hospitality is a difficult industry to be doing that within? Um. Well, it depends what you mean by difficult. I mean, I, th- I think the the there's drawbacks with hospitality. Like, I think the the good thing about hospitality is you can open a profitable business. Normally, you'd probably need some money from somewhere, mm. but you can open a business and be profitable. You know, if you open a restaurant or a bar, you can be profitable in the first week of opening. Um, but then there's a limit on that. There's a limit on how far you can take that profit, and there's a really really hard ceiling. On, on the amount of profit that a restaurant can make. And from there, you're looking at a com- either a completely different concept or getting into franchising, both of which are incredibly difficult and, um, you know, fraught with like, so much could go wrong. And, and that's, when, that's when, you know, making the leap between having one good restaurant and having a really successful hospitality brand mm. is something that almost no entrepreneurs make. Yeah. So it, it, there's pros and cons. I think with, with the brewery... Um, it's a bit of both because we've got the venue here, which as a bar can be quite profitable because we're selling at a good margin. We've uh, only got one or two staff members and mm-hmm. we're, um, you know, we're getting paid as soon as we sell the beer, mm. which is nice. But then there's a ceiling on that as well. And the wholesale business has much more potential as sort of a high value product. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of the innovation, a lot of the innovation in beer to me is, marketing like innovation in marketing is super important like that's probably something people like, i naturally think about because i'm a marketing person but 
you know, when, when I think of the big brewers that are doing really well or the, like the new craft breweries that are doing well, I think it's, it's, of course it's product, but I don't think anyone's like particularly innovating in some sort of crazy technical way. A lot of it is to do with marketing and the way they package mm. the beer, the way they tell their story, the attention they get, obviously the product itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's room for that. There's heaps of room for that. There's heaps of room for companies to come in with a unique story or with a unique way of executing something. Well, um, Matt Kierkegaard told us a bit about that on, uh, on an earlier episode. Yeah. Um, but how do you think a brewery can really innovate in that sense? Can, is, is it, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So how, how do you think breweries can innovate like that? Well, it probably depends on what their model is too. Like um, what you'll probably see start happening a lot in Australia is just these brew pubs, which in America are everywhere. And in other states in Australia, they're kind of everywhere, but not, not as prevalent as other parts of the world. Um, but that's going to start happening a lot in Australia. And if that's your model, um, I think that's there's, there's, there's heaps you can do there. I mean, there's heaps you can do with food and there's heaps you can do with music and events and mm. just the way you've desi- the way you design and execute the building. Like mm-hmm. there's, there's a lot of stuff you can do when you're executing a venue like that. Mm. Um, and again, this is all new to me because I'm an online business guy, so I know nothing about any of this stuff. Um, but... If a brewery as a brand, like as a product, um, I think it's going to come down to it. It comes down to product choice, and it also comes down to branding and marketing and story. And so I think, mm. like, I feel like we've had a, a bit of a unique thing with our thing of you know these three blokes having a crack at a brewery and doing this beer with Call of Duty and doing crowdfunding. <laughs> um, that's another thing that I'm pushing pretty hard is this idea of uh, raising money from uh, crowdfunding when that comes out. Yep. When equity crowdfunding comes out. So I'd like to be a bit of a pioneer in that if the timing is right. Mm-hmm. Um, other breweries that have come on the scene have got their own unique thing. Like if you look at what Bolt has done, like they've, they've just smashed it. Mm. And like within, you know, I'm sure within a couple of years that they're, they're going to be one of the top craft breweries in the country if they're yeah. not bloody there already. Yeah. Um, and it's it, they've just executed everything really well. I don't, I don't know that they've necessarily done any kind of major innovation. They've just every single aspect of launching a brand they've executed amazingly well it's an mm. amazing product the the venue is incredible the branding is amazing you know it's just it's just all very very well executed mm. so um i think that's that's going to become pirate life's another one that just just kind of came out mm. of nowhere and just exploded with great products um great branding and you know the, the, the pushing the boundaries with cans i mean again i don't know if it's necessarily innovation but it's it's a lot of it is around product and marketing. So I think there's, yeah, there's plenty more room, but I think that's going to become almost the standard. Like I think, I think you'll get brew pubs that open that will support a local community that don't have to be crazy and different. But if you're going to want to build a big uh, business around the product, I think this level of execution is going to become the standard. Like it's mm. not going to be enough anymore to produce an average product with average branding and no story yeah. because there's, it's, you're not going to get attention for it. Yeah, I um I I, ex- I saw a lot of that in Melbourne when I was down there last time. Um, exactly exactly that process that everyone's doing this crazy awesome marketing and it well not everyone but a lot a lot more than yeah. up here anyway. But um we are reaching the end of the episode. I just got a couple more questions for yeah. you and we'll wrap it up. What is your biggest challenge right now? Um. Uh... That's a good question. I mean, I think with a brewery, cash flow is always a big challenge. Um, I think what will be a, a big challenge when we get our expansion underway and we get more tanks will be sales. So that's something else I'm spending a bit of time on is figuring out how is the sales team going to look, like what what system are we going to use for managing sales. That's that's a big one. And, and again, something I haven't done before because sales is not something that I gravitate to, but with beer... It's, it's a really core part of our business and yeah. it's, it's a part that none of the founders really have any experience with. So we're getting, you know, getting some external help with that. Um, obviously, making all the beer is challenging, but selling all the beer and keeping the brand growing is equally challenging. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, that's going to be our next sort of six months. If we get the, the tanks in October-ish, potentially we're going to be able to make three times as much beer as we currently make. Yeah. And we're going to have to figure out a, how we can get through cash flow wise without going out of business mm-hmm. and B, how do we sell all of that beer 
um, you know, how do we ramp up that production as quickly as possible so we can sell all that beer consistently. So that's going to, yeah, they're going to be the, the big things. Awesome. So what would it mean to be able to solve that sort of problem? It means you can, again, don't want to put words in your mouth. Well, I mean, it's just, this is just what being an entrepreneur is. You have these problems that you, um, you enjoy solving yeah. and, and you choose the problems that you want to solve and we will solve them because that's our job. Love it. Um, so yeah, yeah. That, I mean, it's, it's gonna be. It's gonna mean our business is much bigger. It's gonna be more valuable. And the quicker we can get to that production, the quicker we can do an equity crowdfunding raise to build something else. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm interested in. If equity crowdfunding comes in in sort of Marchish next year, um, and we've still got a triple production before we need any more money to expand to another venue or another brewery or figure out how to make way more, mm-hmm. then the timing won't be great for, for us. So growing as quickly as possible so we, so we can do that, but safely, not just going crazy. Yep. yep. Um, Sustainable growth, yeah. Yeah. And also also knowing that at the moment it's the middle of winter, which is quiet season, mm-hmm. and a year from now it's going to be the same when all the equity crowdfunding stuff comes out. So, this, mm. yeah, there's going to be a timing issue there. But, yeah, if, if we can grow to do that as quickly as possible, I think that's a real opportunity that, that we're in a really good position to do. And I'd like for us to be the one who does it and not someone else. Yep. Because um, I think it's an opportunity. But um, again, the timing, like we said at the start, it's all about timing. And if the timing's not right, it's not right. Cool. So what uh, what single resource would you give to help someone achieve success in hospitality? Oh God! Well, see, this is a thing. I mean, I've got no experience in hospitality. It's it's, it's, it's why well, I'm on your hospitality podcast. But I think I think it's um it's such a broad term. It, it really just depends on what they're doing. You know, mm. if it's a if it's a product, if if you're going into brewing, then the number one thing is you need to have a brewer who knows what they're doing. Mm. And and there's there's going to be more and more breweries that open up because someone thinks they can do good home brew. Um, but it's just a bare essential to have a really good brewer um, and also just product and marketing. Mm. So I, I don't know if there's one person or one thing you can look at. I think with, with it's just it's just ongoing mm-hmm. with that kind of stuff. For, for other, other hospitality stuff like venues, um, I just, I'm talking out of school to give anyone <laughs> advice about that, I think. Well, uh, you downplay it, but but everything that you've talked about is absolutely relevant to hospitality. Uh, and obviously, you're you're building a business that is going very well in, in hospitality. Yeah. So, um, to- totally relevant uh, to the hospitality industry. Yeah, well, um, I think I think it's good to look at what other companies are doing, like with um, you know, with breweries. Like, we'll look at what other, what the other breweries have done and get inspiration from that. Obviously, otherwise, we, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing Mm -hmm. so i assume the same exact same thing would apply like if if i was to start a restaurant i would be going to every other restaurant and i'd be paying attention to every last detail because i think that's the stuff that a lot of people will go into like this is this is a lot of the stuff with architecture is like a lot of people will go into a space and feel a certain way but they won't make the transition to know why they feel that way like you might go into a restaurant and you'll be like i really like this restaurant and most 90% of people will probably just assume it's because it's got good food. Mm. But I'd say it's more the other way around. Like it, it, it would be more 90% of it is the way it's designed and executed and all those little details mm. that you don't know that you see, but you do That's see. Right. And so I think if, if you're going to go into that industry, you need to look at the details and um, and realize that that some of those little details could be the difference between make or break in that industry. So look at who's doing it really well and how they're doing it mm-hmm. and um, get exposure to as much of it as you can as opposed to kind of just picking one person. Mm. Well, the last one I like to leave with is what's next for Dan Norris? Uh, just more of the same. Yeah, I, I, I'm not really doing anything else outside of Black Ops. So mm-hmm. um, we want to get more of the pale ale into cans. Uh, we want to get our beer broader than just sort of Gold Coast in Brisbane. We want to get our Hornet into cans. There's... The next 12 months are going to be massive. Mm-hmm. So once we wrap up the investment, we've got the expansion into next door. We've got more canning, um, more beer releases. Mm. The, the bar, we're going to get extra hours and a bit, a bit more activity and do events at the bar. So it's, it's all going to be all black ops and the next year is going to be pretty exciting. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for being on the show, Dan. It's been awesome. There's been a, a crazy amount of wisdom that, that you've shared with us about, about marketing and about hospitality despite, uh, <laughs> despite what you say there. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for the book. Uh, and it's been awesome having you in today. Awesome. Thanks for having me. 
If you enjoyed the episode today, leave us a like and consider following us on iTunes, Instagram, or Facebook. If you didn't, let us know why too. For a feature, interview, or if you know a hospitalpreneur, email me at hospitalpreneurs at gmail.com. Speak with you soon. Cheers.